What's up guys and welcome back to Moan Inc. If you guys are new here, then what's up? My name's Erica. Heya, how you doing? For today's video, as you can see from the title, I will be chatting to an incredibly famous author, incredibly famous fiction author in the Greek mythological retelling space, and that is Jennifer Saint. Now Jennifer's actually appeared twice before on the channel, once to discuss her debut novel Ariadne, and secondly to discuss Electra, which was her second book, but today we will be discussing her third published book in this genre, and that is Atalanta, which is sitting so beautifully right next to me. Now I have been ready for this interview, you guys, since late November, early December, when I finished reading the book, and let me just say right off the bat, Atalanta is a gorgeous, gorgeous retelling of this incredible heroine story. So first things first, before we dive into that, Jennifer, thank you so much for sitting with me for a third time to chat about your Greek mythological retellings. It means the world to me. Well, thanks so much for having me back on for a third time. So do you want to start this video? Because I just think that you do this best. Do you want to start this video by giving us an elevator pitch of what Atalanta is about? Because that is the book that we're here to discuss today. Okay. Well, actually, so you're my first interview about Atalanta, so I haven't I haven't got it practiced yet. It's not it's not polished. Um, but yeah, so Atalanta is the story of a legend everybody has heard, but a heroine most people have not encountered. Um, so it's the story of a woman who is abandoned by her parents, raised by bears, adopted by Artemis, and ends up joining Jason and the Argonauts. Um, and I felt like she'd kind of been written out of that story in so many famous versions of it. And so I just wanted to have a lot of fun writing her back in. So how long have you wanted to write about Atalanta? Because I was thinking of the timeline from when we first spoke to then you had done an interview before that with Liv on Myths Baby and you mentioned that Atalanta was your favourite myth. So I was wondering if, did you always know you wanted to write this book? Or did this kind of creep up on you when you were writing Ariadne? And you knew that like, oh, I can do this, so Atalanta will come later. So I, yeah, I must have had an inkling, um, but I tend to be very focused on the book I'm writing at the time. So I know that there are authors who kind of have like a list of all these things they're going to cover in the future. And I just kind of think, I, I treat every book as though it's going to be my last really. Um, but that's just my inability to multitask. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I didn't have clear plans for it. I had finished writing a first draft of a lecture and I'd sent it off to my editors. And I knew that it would be a while till I heard back from them because it was like October time in publishing there's the Frankfurt book fair and so I knew, I knew that I had a few weeks clear um, and in November of course so many authors so many writers do NaNoWriMo in November and I did not have another book ready to go um, but I did want to write every day of November that this must have been like 2020 it was it was kind of covid -y times um i get very confused 21 i think um so my kids were in and out of school because it was when the bubbles kept bursting and um, so it's very frustrating um but i just sat so i sat myself rather than kind of embark on a whole new project write a, like a mini myth every day um so i picked all these different women from mythology just kind of like plucked from the top of my head or from something i'd read or like seeing maybe an instagram post from somebody like you just whoever sort of um, struck me on the day and Atalanta was one of them and I wrote that kind of 1500 words whatever it was and I thought I really love this it was the story of her adoption by the bears but this is so great um, and it kind of stuck with me like well maybe maybe she could be a book maybe there's there's more to her story um, and there were some elements of her story that I just thought how on earth could you ever put that into a novel um the foot race with Hippomenes um I was just thinking how 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 could you frame that 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 was a real sticking point for me for a long time um how I could turn that myth into something that would make any sense <laughs> um, and so yeah so it was kind of on my mind but I just thought there's a great voice there there's a great story and a really different kind of heroine to one that I'd, I'd kind of in tackled before um and very much the fact that she is so little known I thought she deserves to be better known and I just spent a lot of time with these women who are so famous in mythology Clytemnestra, Electra, Cassandra and um, so there was something really appealing about now let's go kind of tunneling into the niches of Greek mythology and let's pull somebody out into the light who really hasn't had much attention so far. And do you remember the first time that you discovered 
Atalanta because that was like the main thing that I said in my review of the book with no spoilers, which I never do, but I was like, I refuse to give any spoilers about this book. Uh, but was just how when I was reading, it was really nostalgic for me because I was sort of transported back to being like this 13, 14 year old that read about her for the first time and was like, whoa, this person's amazing. And I was wondering if you, like, do you remember that? Or is it more so a case of like, you just know that she was there the whole time? So I think probably um, the time that I was introduced to her would have been reading Ovid's Metamorphoses. So it would have been like in my late teens at some point, uh, maybe university. Um, so it, I think it probably would have been the Caledonian boar hunt, which actually isn't very representative of the rest of her. Well, it is in so many ways because it's a, a testament to her strength and her prowess. But it's a story that's quite a tragic one, very dark in Ovid's Metamorphoses. It's a really, um, a really powerful scene when he writes it. And I revisited it to obviously get some inspiration for this um, iteration of Atalanta. So that was probably how I came across her. Um, but her story is quite fragmented and very likely um, that there were possibly two Atalantas originally in mythology. Then it might not have been this one woman. It could have been that we've got two sets of parents offered for her, two different birth locations. And there's a story about this um, very proficient runner who whose father insists that she marries and she says, I'll only marry the man that can meet me in a foot race and nobody can. And then there's the woman who is the... Um, raised by bears and uh, becomes a huntress kind of in the, in the sort of mortal counterpoint to Artemis um, that she exists as as well and at some point it seems likely that perhaps these two versions got merged um, or maybe just she's so amazing that a lot of people wanted to lay claim to her and um, it's quite hard to unpick um, but yeah so her story they seem to exist quite separately, really, um, kind of putting them in order and sort of a chronology and putting them together. I think I came to parts of her life at different times. Atlanta is, as you were saying, like such a fragmented character. So what sources did you have to hand? Because I was thinking as I was reading the book as well, going, oh my God, there is just so much stuff in here from like one line that's here and like one reference that's there. Did you have one like Ovid, for example, that you relied on more heavily than others or was it also a combination of thinking well who like who do I think this woman is as well um well you know that I do really love to pick and choose my sources I really like to kind of put in all bits from from as many different places as I can and um, my main source text honestly was the Argonautica which Atalanta isn't in. She makes this little cameo appearance when she asks Jason to join um, to join the Argo and he says, no, you are a woman. Um, it's absolutely ridiculous. You'll, you'll be far too much of a distraction. Um, and so she gives him her spear and he takes her spear with him as this emblem of her. And um, so I... I really enjoyed the idea that I could use that as the framework, certainly for the central section of the book, which deals with the Argo. Um, I thought there was kind of a hint there that there was a dialogue because obviously, um, so this is where I get my Apollonius and my Apollodorus mixed up. So forgive me in advance. So Apollonius of Rhodes wrote the Argonautica. I think I've got that right. <laughs> great um and sort of some centuries later a long time later you've got the apollodorus library of greek mythology which lists atalanta as one of the argonauts and it made me think well there must be then it, it sort of suggests a kind of dialogue going on that why did apollonius include this kind of atalanta's coming on board oh no she's not i felt like he was probably answering some existing versions which then later apollodorus is drawing on to say she was on the argo so i really liked the idea that kind of he wrote her out and then i could put her in i could put her in this story that already exists and that left a lot of room for creativity for imagining who she could be because i'm reading this this epic um, where all of these things happen that I include in my novel, but she's not there. So it's kind of to see it through her eyes now. Let's kind of put her in the centre of this picture, which what what would she have done in these situations? So it was it was really like that, that it was more here are the stories. Now let's put Atalanta in them. And sort of trying to figure out what those ancients as well would have written her as as well. Like that's kind of how I felt when I was reading it, that it was like, well, what were those stories once that we don't necessarily have that full version. As you say, we have these references to her. So we know she, in lots of versions, was probably on the Argo with all the men, but we don't have that book. So it was sort of like you went, here it is. <laughs> that is that is exactly, exactly the motivation, yeah. So as you said, though, a lot of this book, a good central chunk of it is set on the Argo with all the Argonauts. 
That's a lot of men. There are lots of men that are, not all of them are front and center. They're on the periphery because obviously Atlanta is our front and center. But what was that like for you? Because this is very different from the other two books that you have written. Yeah, that was really fun, actually, um, because obviously the kind of the idea of Ariadne was to push the men deliberately to the sidelines. That was the whole point of writing that book. Um, you know, here's like a male dominated legend. And now we're going to kind of push the men to the periphery um, and see what it's like without them there. Um, so it was it was really. And then obviously in Electra, they're all absent. They're all fighting in Troy. And um, so they're physically removed from the situation. So it was really fun to write some male characters and and to have a little bit more freedom to experiment with different kinds of men. And um, because the Argo is such um, it's so appealing because it's like it's like a kind of it's the Avengers of Greek mythology. It's like this ensemble cast where you get all these um big name characters. And um, so Heracles is on there, obviously. And um, you've got Jason, you've got Peleus, the father of Achilles, um, and uh Castor and Polydeuces. All, all of these kind of these figures that you see elsewhere in different stories that kind of pop up in other places. So putting them all together and thinking, um, what are the differences between them was was really, um, really rewarding to kind of think about here are here are some different approaches to what a Greek hero might have been like, because they are so distinct. They are so different from one another. And the contrast between Heracles and Jason is so marked that you have Heracles, who is very much this like archetypal hero he is like big and brawny and strong and kind of defines so much around him um, and then you have Jason who really in the Argonautica is kind of ineffectual <laughs> and um, you know you sort of wonder why on earth he's leading the voyage in the first place so it was it was interesting to kind of play with different ideas of what men can be like and it gave me the chance to bring in you know some really um nice men for the, for the for the first time um because we had so many um there i kind of thought you know what if we had some men on board who actually are not threatened by Atal atalanta's presence what if we have some men who accept her as one of them as well and what will the tensions be and the dynamics be and how will that play out i thought was um just a way to have have some fun with greek mythology again well a character i loved I absolutely adore throughout your book and I don't want to ruin the book at all but I loved Meliega. Do you say Meli, Mel, Meliega? Because I've heard other people say it that way and I'm like am I saying it wrong because I say Meliega. So in my head it's definitely Meliega but who knows. Okay maybe it's like a British American pronunciation issue but I loved your version of him. I thought he was just so great and so I was wondering what your inspiration for him was because he comes up in Ovid. We were just talking about the Caledonian boar hunt. So that's where we see him a lot. And actually, I actually remember the first time reading that myth, I was like, he's so great. Oh my goodness, he's such a great man amongst all of these terrible people sometimes in myth. Um, but I loved your version of him. So I was wondering, like, who did you draw from in order to create this character? Was it purely the mythologies or were you inspired by you know, anybody else in the public eye or in your life? Because I recently spoke to Mark Knowles. He did a retelling of Jason and the Argonauts, but he doesn't have Atalanta in it. And he said something really funny, which is the reason why I'm asking this, because I asked him, well, how did you relate to Jason? He said, oh, I watched Moana and there was this song in Moana that helped me relate. And I was like, what? So I was wondering if you had a moment like that where it's something oddball or if it was just the mythology that inspired Meliega for you. Oh, um, I definitely don't have a Moana incident for Jason. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. And um, makes me want to rewatch the film and uh, and reinterpret Jason differently. Um, so no, it was I was very heavily, I very heavily drew on Ovid, on the Caledonian boar hunt scene in Ovid. Uh, just because it feels like something you just don't often see um in this whole this whole huge epic poem of all of these um assaults and transformations and and, you know, it, a lot of it, although I love the metamorphoses, a lot of it makes a quite grim reading. And so does the Caledonian boar hunt. Um, but Meliega just really shines out as, as an example. Not perfect. Definitely some flaws, definitely some issues. Um, but the the fact that um, he, Atalanta, joins this boar hunt and he just takes takes the help you know we need as many kind of strong heroes as we can artemis has sent this wild boar it's causing terrible destruction all hands on deck let's go for it and um, she is the first one to draw blood from the boar and so when he kills it um he awards her the 
the tusk and the the tusks and the hide as the prize and that causes a great ruckus with some of the others um and i just liked the fact that okay we've got somebody whose masculinity is not challenged here by the fact that she was actually the first one to draw blood he feels kind of confident enough in himself and he's the one who kills the boar um that that he can cope with a woman having been successful and it feels like a this kind of moment of sort of egalitarianism in in Ovid that that actually just feels really great to read aside from everything else that happens in that episode um I mean maybe you could you could describe more cynical motives to him because he falls in love with her um and does he think that this is like the best possible seduction technique of a woman to give her, obviously, boar tusks? It works every time. Um, so maybe he's got, maybe he's sort of got um, another agenda in mind. You could definitely write him that way. But I thought, like you, I guess I thought, well, the first time I read it, I read it quite uncynically. And although you can definitely return to it with a much more sceptical mindset, I thought I was going to stick with that perception of him. I think it is so easy though, as you reread any myth to go in with it, like in a cynical mindset of just like, as you said, you're like, oh, well, this is the way he's going to seduce her because she's obviously this hot commodity, like look at her go. But also I think comparison wise, as you said, Meliega's not perfect. Like that's absolutely, it's impossible to find a perfect person in Greek myth at all. But comparison wise, I was always like, what a gem. Like, I mean, the bar is low. Especially compared to like the other men that you write, like Agamemnon. <laughs> and it, well, Theseus is there in the Caledonian boar hunt. So, you know, already he's, he's off to a great advantage. So I was also wondering as I was reading the book, because with your other two books, with Ariadne and with Electra, I could see your touch points with those main characters. So there were scenes that maybe weren't standout scenes, but I could tell that this was like, your moment of connection with them, if that makes sense. So when it came to Ariadne, I remember reading the scene where Ariadne sees Theseus for the first time. And it's like watching a car crash because she's like, oh my God, he's so gorgeous and he's so nice to me. And it's awful in the best way. That's a compliment, even though it doesn't sound like it. (laughs) But you know, she's this young, naive woman that has never fancied a guy before, really fancies him and it goes terribly for her. And I could tell that was you being like, I've been a young girl that's seen an attractive man, there we go. And the same with, uh, in Electra, the scene with Clytemnestra, which we spoke with about at length last time, about how uh, Iphigenia dies and it's the mother discussing this awful instance that happens. That was clearly, and again, we spoke about this so much, you connecting as a mother to this scene. So I was wondering with Atalanta, what was your touch point with her? Did you have, because I think she's just such a superwoman like in Greek myth. So what was that moment of relation between you and the characters you were writing? Oh my God, it was so much harder because Atalanta is all the things I am not. She's really outdoorsy. She's really athletic. Um, She's not afraid of confrontation. (laughs) Uh, She is in no way like a people pleaser. Um, So it was much, much harder to, to kind of, to to find a way to relate to her on that level um but that also made her a really great character to write because i really enjoyed the escapism of writing atalanta and that kind of feeling of of when we get to moments in the novel where she's got to make a decision thinking what would i do okay she's going to do the opposite then (laughs) and it's going to go really well (laughs) most of the time um but definitely with atalanta i thought the um the connection that she has with nature, um, with the with the world around her, um, that she grows up in the forests of Artemis, and it's this really, um, she's so very aware of her place in nature and that world, um, and that I found was was a way to understand her a bit, to think about that that way where she she's got a real a real sense of place and a real sense of the connection of everything around her and how the whole ecosystem of the forest works. Um, That I think I just, I love to be outdoors. I love to be, I mean, as just said, I'm not outdoorsy. I I meant in kind of like a sporty sense. Um, But you know, (laughs) yeah, I I really, I really love that aspect of Atalanta, how she, she's just, she's very untouched by the rest of the world for a lot of her life. And so when she comes into it, then there's there's that kind of like um, elf sort of scenario where she, she's kind of trying to work out how, how things work, which I really love um, differently. Um, 
but yeah I, I really I really that was probably how I got into who she might be thinking about how she um how she fits into the natural world that's really interesting because I was I mean, but I'm not somebody who's connected to nature whatsoever because I grew up in a city. So that for me, as, you, as I was reading it, I love those moments, but those were my out of touch moments with her where I was like, I've got no idea what, I just have to trust you, you know? Like, as opposed to having those moments of me connecting to the character, I was like, that's great that she can run through the forest. She knows the forest like the back of her hand and, you know, raised by bears and how she has all of the other women as well, like around her that also sort of help that community, you know, all of that, I was like, that's great, but I have no idea what's going on. And when she's like with the boys, funny enough, that was my touch point with her. Cause I grew up with two brothers and I did all the sports that they did. My mom would just send me with them. And I was oftentimes the only girl in these sports teams. So when she was interacting with all the boys, I was like, this I get, <laughs> like this I, I can relate to her. Interesting, yeah, so I was the other way around. <laughs> so a myth that you mention as well, speaking of the other women, who impact, I'm doing my best, if you can't tell, to not give away any spoilers whatsoever. <laughs> I have like the most awkward sentences, just like this kind of aspect. Uh, but the women, somebody that you mentioned at the beginning, this is not a spoiler, anybody, I swear, um, is Callisto. So you start off the story with Callisto and the other woman, but mainly focusing on Callisto and her myth. So I was wondering what it was about Callisto's myth that made you want to include this in the book. So Atalanta grows up outside of the of the normal world, like I said. So that made her different to Ariadne, different to Electra, in that she's she's not aware, it's not ingrained into her the way it is for those other women, and um, the way that the world works. And Callisto and also Arethusa as one of the other nymphs that um, that I mentioned, are ways where Atalanta can become educated about that about this other danger and um, because there's the stories of Atalanta where she's where she's not rescued necessarily by Artemis though she's always kind of spoken about in relation to Artemis it's kind of you know that she is favored by Artemis perhaps and um, but a lot of stories she's adopted by hunters and the um the reading of that tends to be well they must have been men then and so she she kind of actually does grow up in a human society raised by men and I really didn't want that for her at all I wanted to keep her in this kind of magical idyll of the forest um where Artemis watches over them um and and it's nymphs who are involved in her education so having Callisto in there is is a way that she does get introduced to the darker side, um, which is so important because although I wanted the forest to be like a kind of a paradise, it's also realistically, I, I like I said, she's very much aware of her place in nature. There are all kinds of dangers. She does have to grow up a survivor. Um, and so including those stories is a is a way to bring in that kind of threat that exists on the fringes and the something that she's going to encounter later in life when she does join the rest of the world as well. Also something I thought was good, and I don't know, I, I find it's a problem because I'm so familiar with the classics world that I'm just like, what are people familiar with and what are they not familiar with? And so when I was reading it, I thought, oh, this could also be really good if people know Callisto, but they don't know Atalanta, of kind of having this really nice like slide into the myth of like, well, here's one you might have heard. And now we're going to show you one that's completely different. Like I thought it was a really good way of structuring the book, specifically with Callisto, because I think more people are familiar with that name than any of the other myths or any of the other um, Artemis references that are made in the beginning of it. I thought that was a really good one to, to start the book with, to, yeah, it anchors you in, in those more familiar myths. And the same with Acteon and Artemis and Acteon as well, um, which is another another one of those touch points to people where they're going to think, oh, yes, I know where we are. In a terrifying way with Acteon, like not a nice myth at all. I mean, Callisto isn't nice either, but Acteon for me always, when I would read that, I was like, this is like the be all end all of just absolutely terrifying godly behaviour. 
Yeah, and I think it's so important to understand Artemis as not this just this kindly protector. Obviously, that this is one of her roles to protect young girls. Um, and as well as being the goddess of hunting, she's a goddess of childbirth. So she has this nurturing aspect to her, but she is just as terrifying as all of the Olympian gods. And I think her encounter with Acteon, it's so unusual for us to see this in Greek mythology. Um, you see so many times nymphs and women bathing, caught in a vulnerable situation. And the inevitable happens to them. And with Artemis, when she is um, seen in a state of, of nakedness, then she turns this just totally unjustified vengeance onto Acteon. And it is such a cruel punishment. I just think it, that is so fundamental to understanding who the gods are, that they are not just another human character in the novels, that they are operating in a totally different way on a totally different moral spectrum um, to any of the other characters. So having, having that in the novel, I think is really important in underlining this is not just like a nice lady <laughs> in any way. Now, as somebody who studied classics, because that was, again, we discussed so much stuff in the other interviews, guys. Like, I would just recommend watching those as well, because we went through Jennifer's whole background with classics, her teaching background, all of this. So this is really the third in the installment. But with a background in classics, then a background in teaching, and, you know, coming from an academic background, really, yourself, when you're dealing with these mythological characters, because there are so many in this one, do you feel a sense of responsibility to show them correctly to a new audience? Or is it a combination of correctly, but also reimagined, and that's the main responsibility? Yeah, I think just the whole issue of correctness is one that you could get stuck on um, forever and never never move past at all, because what is the correct depiction of these characters? Um, what is the definitive and there is no definitive version of any of the stories any of the characters um but there's certainly kind of i guess a flavor that comes through so when it came to characters in this novel like heracles and later on medea there was definitely i felt a real sense of responsibility that these are this is where readers are coming in with some preconceptions about who they are. And these are mythological figures who are so significant and so important. And to not have them dominate the novel, because both of them really wanted to take over <laughs> whenever they were in any scenes, um, because they're just they're so compelling. Um, but to to kind of give that sense of of the characters that we we do know, but maybe maybe we're gonna because we're seeing them through Atalanta's eyes, maybe we are gonna see them from a slightly different angle. Maybe we are going to perceive them um, in slightly um, sort of tilted perspectives, I suppose. Um, because there there is just no point. I think what I always come back to is there is no point in just regurgitating something that already exists. If you are going to write Greek mythology, you have to bring something else to it. So. You, and when you start writing characters, they do take on some kind of independent life within your pages. It's just it's just the way that writing works. I couldn't agree more. And I think the more retellings, the reason also why I asked that question is because the more retellings that come out, the more of the critique I see of people saying, oh, well, that's not this version or that's not this version or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, but there's space. These are characters. They're not people. Like they're fictional beings that you can run and have fun with or you can tell from as you say different perspectives like all of your argonauts are very different to since i mentioned mark Knoll's before they're very different to his because he's telling them from jason's point of view and yours are from atalanta's so it's how does your character interact with these very strong characters as well and quite often when we read a myth, we know what happens to a person, but not necessarily how they feel about it inside. So I think when you're going into that kind of that very intimate perspective of we are seeing uh, inside somebody's mind, then we do find something different anyway. Um, so, I mean, I talked a lot about Clytemnestra and murdering Cassandra in um, in Electra and how I felt that that event can happen, but you can see that, you can write that as she is murderous and vindictive and she is violent and unhinged, or you can write that as an act of compassion and mercy and kindness. And that completely changes who that character is, but you are still telling the same story. Absolutely, especially with Clytemnestra, I feel like there are so many different ways of tackling that character. Like your portrayal of her is so different to like Costanza Cassati's portrayal 
of Clytemnestra in very similar instances. Like, we'll see the same scene, but very differently. So I couldn't agree with that more. But something I wanted to ask you as well about writing is since you have these three huge books, you've done this process, just so everybody knows, we're doing the interview March 27th and the book is released April 13th. So we're two weeks out, just over two weeks out from the book being released. You've done this three times now. Does it get any easier to sit through this period when you know the book is coming out and it's waiting there and it's going to hit the shelves? How does that feel for you? Um, oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It doesn't say, so it's really exciting because I know how fun it is to launch a book. It is so much fun. Um, but I guess there is there is more pressure probably every single time of thinking, if somebody really loved my previous two books, just, you know, is 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 this going to be the one where, where it disappoints them? Um, or, you know, are, are they going to love it just as much? Um, so there is definitely that builds and builds every time, I think, that you just, you, you just think, oh God, I hope I haven't got it completely wrong. <laughs> this time do you think the pressure for you with regards to like because you've released three standalone books they are are they a series they're a greek mythology series i would say probably but they are three standalone books you do not have to read one to read the other you don't even have to know mythology to read one like you explain everything that you need to know in the pages of all of your books so i was wondering does that make it maybe easier as well because I think when you're writing a series like you know Elodie for example is writing a series where she's like am I going to do the end of the story the justice that people who loved the first book want in the last book whereas because for you it's three separate stories are you more so hoping that you're on the right wavelength with your readers or yeah it's so much worse for Elodie I tell her all the time I'm so glad I didn't write a trilogy <laughs> um, but then also from the outside we all know that Elodie's going to do an amazing job and that the third um, of the Wolf Ten trilogy is just going to be incredible um, so it's it's much easier I think from the outside to think um, to think everything's everything's going to be fine um, inside I guess you are always going to have those doubts but I have a lot of faith in Atalanta and I just think I enjoyed writing this book so much and I feel that I, I feel really proud of Atalanta. So there is, I think, definitely an increased, like an increased kind of just sense of, I've done a good job, it's okay. And you hope it's gonna land well, but I think whatever happens, I am so happy with this book. I mean, you should be. Like, this is something I said to you in person as well when we saw each other in February, I think. No, January, whenever that was. But I mean, I've thought since I literally put the book down when I finished it, this is like the next Cersei. Like this is a character that people don't know, like Cersei, like no one knew who, who that was until Madeline Miller pu published that book. And I think this is going to have that same appeal, which is like, this is a genre people are now very familiar and comfortable in because of, you know, the work of so many incredible authors doing the work of like pushing this out to the general public. And now you're throwing in this wrench, basically, of like, here's a character you didn't know, have fun with it. And I just think people are going to react so well to it. And it's going to be such a fan favorite. Well, I mean, thank you. I hope so. <laughs> um, but also, yeah, there is there is an element of that as well, where I'm just thinking, I'm so glad people are going to know who Atalanta is. Because so many people, when I said this is going to be my third book, just said, who? Um, when I said the name. And so I just think, yeah, no, people are going to know her now. And people are going to know these just, she she just has some of the best stories in mythology. She really, really does. Um, so I um, I feel great about that. But yeah, she's, she's um. I'm glad her story is going to be out there. So now that you've written three books, you announced three books, you wrote three books, this wonderful book is coming out. I'm not, and I want to preface this by saying, what's the next book? That's not the question. <laughs> the question is, what is next for you that you see yourself doing? Do you want to continue writing or do you see yourself venturing out into wider projects? Because you just did, uh, which we were talking about off camera, uh, a weekend away in Athens where you did a writing retreat and one of my friends Cosy went and she said it was incredible guys by the way if Jennifer does another event cannot recommend signing up for it enough Cosy was obsessed with everything that you taught um so I was just wondering you know do you see yourself continuing writing books maybe leaving more time between them or venturing into different things um, so probably both, really. Um, so I really enjoyed kind of having like dipping my toe back in the waters of teaching um, because there was a writing retreat. I did a workshop at King's College in London, which was where I went to university, um, which I really enjoyed doing as well. And um, so, yeah, so I love um, 
I, I love that kind of aspect of, of work that's opened up to me since writing these novels. Um, but I just think I have been writing stories for my entire life. I, I only had them published in the past few years, but I don't see that I would ever, ever stop writing. Okay, so as my final question, Jennifer, shifting gears slightly to wind this down, one last question for you, I promise, and then I will let you go about your day. I started doing this actually right after we last spoke. I started this tradition of asking my guests for advice, for my audience, just so that you guys can pass something on to the next generation of writers, academics, classicists, whoever it is that happens to stumble upon this video. And so with you, I'll change it slightly because I mostly ask professors this question. And so the question for you is, if you could give any advice to you know any budding authors who are watching this, who really look up to you know your writing, your books, have read them and just thought, oh my God, I wanna do that too. Or maybe people who, I don't know, maybe they wanna write you know historical fiction or nonfiction or whatever it happens to be. They see you as such a pioneer in this field of classics and of publishing traditionally and getting insane success from it. Like it's, it's insane how Ariadne has done how Electra has done, and no doubt Atlanta is going to break all of those records. So what is the advice that you would give to that person who has maybe a Word document that is waiting in their computer that has, you know, the majority of their book on it, maybe people who just have an idea, people who just want to be published and who don't know how to go about it. What is the advice that you would give to that person watching this video uh, that is just starting their publishing or writing journey? Well, I mean, it's really that it won't write itself. Disappointing as that is, <laughs> um, you really you really have to prioritise writing in your life if you are going to make a success of it. And I think, um, like I do quite often talk about, you can you can start writing any time in your life. And like I'll say to people, if your dream is to be an Olympic gymnast, like too late, <laughs> um, you have to start that really young. Um, so you know, yeah, bad luck with that. Um, but if your dream is to be a writer, you know, people can have their debut novels published when they are in their eighties. Like there is no, um, there's no time limit on it. Um, but the the kind of the flip side of that is that is that you you have to prioritize it in the way that you would prioritize becoming an Olympic gymnast. You'd put in the hours of training. You have to put in the hours of writing and reading, um, which you cannot do one without the other. Um, I'm going to say like, well, no, so I guess you could read without writing, but you can't write without reading. Um, like read as widely as possible um, and definitely like a, a lot in the genre that you love but I find it so helpful so useful and so enjoyable to read in other genres and to read you know not just historical fiction um but to read all kinds of things um and you you just have to put the hours in in the end um that is the only way to get there you write every book everyone writes every book a word at a time a sentence at a time a chapter at a time and there's no shortcut to doing it now with all that being said guys that seems like the perfect place to sort of cap this for today as i've taken up so much of jennifer's time already and i massively appreciate obviously jennifer for sitting down and chatting with me as i have thanked you multiple times throughout this interview i probably have cut all of those out uh, but also thank you guys so much for watching every single video that you do on this channel. It does mean so much more than I can actually say in a video, you know, on camera. I can't really show you guys how appreciative I am, but I am massively, massively appreciative for all of your support here on the channel. Now, if you guys were convinced throughout this chat to actually buy Atalanta, to pre-order Atalanta, no, actually today you guys can buy it when this goes up. So if you guys want to buy Atalanta, all of the links will be in the description below. You guys can find them down there. Uh, the Amazon link will be down there and I will also link all of Jennifer Saint's social medias so you guys can go and follow her for writing updates in the future, event updates, and all of that sort of stuff. Now, rolling right after these closing credits, I'm going to include part of the conversation that I had with Jennifer, which was mostly about spoilers. Uh, we just decided, I'm not going to include this, but we just decided together that we would actually clip those and stick those at the end. So if you guys want a little bit more information about what the myth really goes into and what this book goes into towards the end, if you guys know the myth already and you guys want to see how Jennifer tackled certain things, stick around because the last part of this video will be spoilers. But if not, then I will see you guys next time with more videos here on Moaning. So I'll see you guys then.
And now for the spoilers. So if you don't want any spoilers, guys, switch off right now. We'll be seeing you with more videos in the future. But there will be Atlanta spoilers after this, right after this clip. So please switch off if you don't want them. But if you do, enjoy. So I have a final question, but before I ask that, uh, I was wondering if there's anything we haven't discussed without spoiling the books. I've been trying not to talk about the last part of the book because all I want to talk about is the race and the lion transformation. I'm like, I can't do any of that. <laughs> I know. Um, I also, I've been thinking, how on earth am I going to talk about this? <laughs> unless, unless in interviews, I just do a, like, this is the spoiler section. Turn off now if you do not want it spoiled. Um, those that those parts of the of her mythology were the bits that put me off writing the novel for a little while because yeah. I wanted to write them so much and I just thought nobody <laughs> is going to accept this it's um her story for you know people who know it people who don't it just it goes so wild um but it is so perfect for who she is um and Oh, maybe we should just say if you like if you don't want spoil if you don't want a spoiler maybe just kind of skip this section of the video I just think that there is um I didn't know how on earth I was gonna tackle the issue of the foot race where Hippomenes um is the eventual victor in the foot race because he scatters golden apples the golden apples of the Hesperides in front of her and somehow this means that she gives up her victory it felt like a really anti-feminist moment I guess if you're thinking I'm writing these books from a feminist perspective she sees something pretty and shiny and so she surrenders her freedom and um and marries somebody and I really I really did not so I really thought how on earth am I going to work that in and kind of make that you know palatable um but there are versions and I think I think in Ovid um I think that you get the sense that her relationship with Hippomenes is that wonderful thing in Greek mythology that we don't often see, consensual <laughs> and enjoyable and based on a kind of mutual respect, not really that he tricks her, but that they find a way that they can both compromise um, to be together, I guess. Um, so I found, I found that I, I I kind of worked my way through that and what these golden apples are, that they are not just a decorative trinket, that the golden apples of the Hesperides have got this very important mythological history, that they were the wedding gift from Gaia, the primordial goddess who creates everything, to Hera, which I found really interesting as this sort of passing on of power through the female line that Gaia singles out Hera to receive this gift. So there's clearly something more about these apples um, than just simply they are very nice. Um, they spark the Trojan War, um, which I rate the story of the Judgment of Paris in the Electra paperback and in the Atalanta Barnes and Noble exclusive edition. So no good for UK readers, very sorry. Um, you have to get it from America. Um, I've written the story of Gaia giving Hera the apples as well. So I'm kind of been linking together the idea of these apples and how crucial they are to all these different myths and um, through my books now there's kind of a you know like a unifying motif there and um, so yeah so he doesn't just he doesn't just throw the apples and she goes oh how shiny <laughs> and that's it there is there is something more powerful to it than that um, and then of course with the transformation into lions Ariadne ended with a transformation and people found it very tragic um I did not find it entirely tragic with Ariadne honestly I felt there was like an element of empowerment in it um but this is like a purely joyful transformation it is so perfect for who Atalanta is and um, again I thought are people going to get to the end of this book and goes she turns into a lion <laughs> is that <laughs> that's what well, they both do if it makes it better like it's not yeah. just one um yeah and I don't know I don't I don't know if it's true or not, but my understanding has always been that there was a belief in the ancient world that lions couldn't mate with one another. And that's why it's punishment, because they've been having sex in the temple of Sibeli. And so she turns them into lions so that they can never do it again. Um, I that's don't... so interesting if that's true, because that's the first time I've heard that. Okay, well, I've definitely heard it, um, and I don't know where they thought baby lions came from. I don't, I, I don't, I, I don't know. Um, but that, that's kind of why it was a punishment. Um, and I just love the idea that 
that punishment was so misguided and then they just go off and have like a lovely lion life together um so it's just it, I, I I wanted to write it so much and I really worried that it was it was going to be hard to to actually make to sell it to people um but actually I mean it's it's amazing <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think it will be at all and I think as well something that those transformations do is sort of remind people as well that these are stories like when you add something mystical to them like that when you have stories though that kind of don't have the gods that are playing an active role you know like Perseus where there are so many gods that come down and they're always doing things and whatever then you know by having these magical elements it just reminds people this is still mythology this is still fantasy so don't you know take this too seriously it's like this was a real person there's a right version of this character she does turn into a lion at the end of it. So let's come back, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely that. Um, and also, like like I mentioned about Ovid's Metamorphoses before, so many of those transformations are so appalling. Like Apollo and Daphne comes to mind immediately where she's transformed into a tree to try and escape his assault of her. And it's so painfully written. It's so immediate. Um, and you really feel her terror and her suffering. So actually, and you know, there are so many like that, Medusa, obviously, all, all of these transformations that um, cause so much misery and, and pain. So actually having a transformation that happens in Greek myth that that is is a triumph is is just I found it really refreshing. I just felt like there is something so different about Atalanta's story and I was really ready for it. You know, I'd spent all of that time immersed in the just the tragedy of Electra, um, which is what I wanted at the time. But then I was really ready for a change in tone and to kind of to see especially a woman of Greek mythology, just really come out on top. Absolutely. I'm, okay, I've decided what I'm going to do with this section is I'm going to just have the video end and then put this at the end of like a spoilers, please only watch <laughs> if you want this to be spoiled. Because even when I was reviewing it, I was like, the last thing I want to do is tell anybody too much information that could possibly ruin this. Because even, even with the apples, like when I read the original myths, I was like, so he has these apples in his pocket. Is that not then making him run slower? Possibly. <laughs> Probably. So why is he doing that in the first place? And he throws one, it doesn't dissuade her. He then has another one that he's re he has ready. So he knows it's not going to work. And then he gets to round three. And then all of a sudden she allows it. And as you said, like, it's quite interesting to see a powerful woman then just be like, okay, I'm going to marry this guy. Like she has lots of other suitors before that who she kills. <laughs> She's like, oh, you lost. Sucks to suck. You can now die. So it is a very interesting myth in that way, especially because she as, as well doesn't want a husband in mythology. Like she makes that clear, like I'm not really down to get married. I would much rather travel around with all these guys. But I thought you handled the ending really, really well. I thought it was just, it all made sense. It all flowed really well together. And it came to this end where I was like, and now they're running off into the sunset. Like. <laughs> It's just, yeah, I think like, the really crucial thing is she makes her choices, doesn't she? Like she chooses because she can absolutely ignore those apples or, you know, I think she can get them and still beat him. Um, but but she she makes that decision. And I guess it was kind of thinking, why does she make it then? 